This morning I'm going to begin a series of studies on the existence of God. Um, interestingly enough, this is one that's not going to have, we're not going to have to flip to that many, many Bible verses for this because the Bible doesn't teach the existence of God. The Bible assumes the, the existence of God. It starts right off from the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There is no explanation as to logically deduce how you arrive at the conclusion that there's a God from the Bible. It assumes to, to be true and teaches it from that point forward. The Bible was not written as an apologetic to try to convince people that there's a God. The Bible was written to God's children to tell them how to live in this world in a manner that would be acceptable to God. And that's one of the great fallacies that so many people run into. So there will not be, we will not be flipping to as many Bible verses this morning and over the course of this study as we normally would. We're not going to be looking at 50 or 60 verses because there aren't 50 or 60 verses. We're going to look at, the, at those that are, that are uh, uh, germane to the study that we're dealing with, but there's just not that many of them. Um, so we're, we're going to look at, at two diametrically opposed schools of thought in this study. We're going to look at theism, and we're going to look at atheism. Theism, according to Webster's um, Dictionary of the American, Eng Eng of the Amer of American English, the 1828 edition, says it's the belief or acknowledgement of the existence of a god as opposed to atheism. Theism differs from deism, for although deism implies a belief in the existence of a god, yet it signifies in modern usage a denial of revelation, which theism does not. Theism accepts revelation from God. Deism doesn't. Deism teaches that God created everything and then left. Left it to its own natural laws to do whatever it was going to do, and there was no revelation from God. Now, in this country today, we have a, a lot of people that try to teach that our founding fathers were theists. They were not. They were deists. They believed in God, but they did not believe in the supernatural. They did not believe in revelation from God. If you look at Thomas Jefferson's New Testament, you will find that he sliced out every passage that deals with miracles, every passage that deals with the supernatural, came up with his own New Testament that is just strictly the history of, of what could be proven with the natural mind. He did not believe that God was involved in what goes on down here. And there are a lot of people today that will sit in a Christian church and really not believe that God's involved in what goes down down here. Um, and we're going to deal with that term here in just a moment. Atheism is the disbelief of the existence of a God or a supreme intelligent being. Okay, so if you believe in a God that gives you revelation, that's theism. If you believe in a God that doesn't give you revelation, that's deism. If you don't believe in a God at all, that's atheism. Um, now, it's, it, it's important to also note that there's another term out there known as practical atheism. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or not. Practical atheism is someone that claims to believe in a God but by their life, they deny that he exists. They don't do anything to serve him. And, and, and the world's full of those people. 
that will claim to believe there's a God, but if you looked at their life, they don't live like there's a God. They don't live like they believe that there's a God. They live just like an atheist. That's practical atheism. And that can actually happen within a New Testament church where you have people that, that are, believe there's a God, but on this point or that point, they don't believe in it, and they will not do what, what God says to do. So on those points, God considers those people to be practical atheists. Okay? Um, now there's another song. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. This is a point that I want you to understand very clearly when you get into a discussion with somebody that claims that they're an atheist. It says, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord. That sounds fairly important, doesn't it? That's, this isn't just an advice. This is charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. I want you to understand something very well. If you get into a conversation with somebody that is an avowed atheist, there's no, there's no sense at all in sitting down and trying to discuss theology with them. There's no sense in trying to discuss morals with them or anything dealing with that because they don't believe in a God anyway. And as we're gonna see in the course of this study, all of those issues of morality if they do not come from God, they strictly come from men. And you can look at this nation at the way that it wavers and the pendulum swings back and forth and back and forth, that we don't believe, this nation doesn't believe in God. The politicians sitting in Washington, they don't believe in God. If they did, they're not theists anyway, because if they were, they'd be standing on this revelation and they wouldn't be arguing some of the things that they're arguing. They wouldn't be changing things that have been long established in the Bible as a moral absolute to something that is completely atrocious and abominable to God. They can do it because they don't believe in God, or at least they don't believe in the God of the Bible. I don't care how much lip service they give it, if their actions speak louder than their words. Okay? So when we deal with that, understand that you get into a conversation with one of these guys, you're, you're, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Spend your time going out and finding somebody that wants to know what God said so they can be obedient to it. Spend your time there. If they're not going to, if they're going to butt their heels, if they're an atheist, leave them alone. God will deal with them later. There's no sense in wasting your time on those. All right, now first off, we need to define to find what God is. That would be the first part of our study. What is God? The dictionary definition says, at least relative to Christianity, which is what we are, so I don't really care what a Buddhist God is or any of the others. We're only dealing with Christian God. The sovereign being, Jehovah, the eternal and infinite spirit, the creator, the sovereign of the universe. One of the things that we have to that we struggle with a lot is people that don't, that especially new Christians that don't realize just how massive this God is. They don't really realize what He is. They just, you know, we've been we've been raised in, a, in a, amongst a generation of people that think He's Mormon, just a big warm and fuzzy Santa Claus type of a character, and they have no idea who God is. So the first thing I want to deal with is who he is. I want you to understand who God is. Now, this is not stuff that I came up with by myself. This stuff has been taught for generations, for centuries. You go back and read Thomas Aquinas or some of the other guys from years, centuries ago. They came up with these arguments. Um, one of the things I find interesting amongst those that, that, are, um, that are atheists or especially those that believe in evolution, and, and you'll ask them a question about this and, and why they believe that, and, and they always like to come off with this idea that they think for themselves. You ever heard that? You hear an atheist say that I think you should think for yourself. Well, are you the smartest thing on the planet? Has there never been anyone smarter than you that's come down the pike, whether it be a biblical character or whether it be a philosopher? Is there no one smarter than you? You have all of the intelligence in the universe 
and so you can think for yourself, go back and look at some of the things that other people have written and try to argue your way through them and see if you can make it through there or not. Thinking for yourself is, it ain't going to help you. You need to rely on others that have thought before you came along. So we have to look back at these guys and the things that are good you keep and the things that are bad you throw away. Like Elder Mott always said, you eat the chicken and throw away the bones. You just have to know what's chicken and what's bones. That's all. Okay, so God and Christianity, the supreme being, eternal and infinite spirit. Since he is the supreme being, I want you to understand this. There is no being that is above him. There is no being that is beyond him. There's no being that is greater than him in any way, shape, or form. He is the epitome of everything good, righteous, everything. He's it. And since God created what we refer to as this space, time, matter, universe, right? We have space and we have, we have those three characteristics in this universe. Since he created that, he obviously transcends that. I mean, if you're going to create something, you had to be there before that was there. He created space, time, and matter. So we cannot limit him by space, time, and matter. You can't limit him that way. He had to be here before space, time, matter in order to create it, right? You don't find an inventor that invents something that was already invented. He was here first. And therefore, you cannot bound him by space, time, or matter. Someone says, well, where did God come from? Well, he was always here. And you can't apply space or time or matter to the discussion of God. He's, he came before that. He's always been here, as we will see. Now, he does have a name. Turn to Psalms chapter 83 and verse 18. Psalms 83, and verse 18, says that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Jehovah is the name of our God. At least in the English language, that is his name. Now, if, if, in a King James Bible, when you, when you read through in the Old Testament, the King James Bible, you will see many times the word Lord capitalized. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is the word Jehovah. When you see that all capitalized Lord in the Old Testament, your King James Bible, that's translating that word Jehovah. There are other places where it will not, where the first, the L will be capitalized, but not the rest of the word. Well, that's translating a different word. But wherever you see all capitalized letters, we're talking about Jehovah. Jehovah means the self-existent or eternal one. That's what the word means. God exists of himself. He owes his existence to no other. Being eternal, he's always existed. He cannot not exist. And he is, or to put it in his own words, he said in Exodus 3.14, if you turn there quickly. I'm sorry, ex yeah, Exodus 3.14. This is when Moses came to him and wanted to know, what do I tell these people? You're going to send me these children of Israel, and, and they're not going to believe me. What do I tell Who are you? What do I tell them? And, and, and God says, and, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus saith, thus thou shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. The word I am translates the Hebrew word haya, which means to be or to exist. He has always been here. He was here before space, time, and matter. He will be here after space, time, and matter. He cannot not exist. That's important to understand. 
He is infinite in duration. He is infinite in power, in presence, in goodness, in knowledge. He is the perfection of being, and there's absolutely no deficiency within God. Think of, think of that. Ponder that for a, night, for a moment. Think of this being that we are here this morning to worship. Think of the power that this being has. Think of a, of a being that can speak this universe into, into existence in, in six days. How, how powerful is that? And, and yet, you know, we all have this problem where we struggle with the idea, well, okay, maybe he can do that, but he can't take care of me. <coughs> maybe he can do that, but, but that's as far as he can go. That's a deist idea. When you start to fall into that and start to lose faith over an issue, you're becoming a deist. And if you let it go too far, that's where you'll end up. And from there, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump into atheism. So God is infinite in duration, in power, in presence, in goodness, in knowledge. Now, the word infinite means having no limit or end. No limit or end whatsoever. Boundless, unlimited, endless, immeasurably great in extent, duration, or other respect and it's used chiefly of God or his attributes. So think about this. As we talk about this being that we call God, think of these terms and apply them to this being. That's who we are worshiping this morning. If God's duration, if his presence, if his power, if his goodness or his knowledge is in any way deficient, then there's a boundary to his duration or his presence or his power or his goodness or his knowledge, right? He's deficient in any aspect whatsoever, then that puts a limit on it. And if there's a boundary to his duration or presence or power or goodness or knowledge, then there's a place where it begins or ends. And if there's a place when there, where that begins or ends, then he has a beginning and he's not infinite. And that's important to hang on to. And if God is not infinite, then he has a beginning, which argues someone or something prior to himself, in which case that someone or something would be God. The only way there can truly be a God is if he is infinite in power, presence, duration, goodness, etc. It's the only way there can be one. And the point of what we want to show today is that, or, or over the course of this study, is that there is one, and he has these attributes. So as we lay the groundwork here, it's important to hang on to these. If he's not infinite, he has a beginning, which argues that someone or something prior to himself. And so if there was something before him, he would have had to have been before himself. And that creates an absurdity. There can only be one of these. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord. Now notice what that is. L, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah. Okay? And what was it that we read over in Psalms 83? That men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. There's only one of them. There's only one God. And his name is Jehovah. It is not Allah. It is not Buddha. It is Jehovah, and he is the only God over everything. And there cannot be two of these beings. You can't have two of them and cancel each other out. There can only be one. Since there can only be one infinite supreme being, all other being must be in and of him as there's nowhere else it can be. Turn over to Acts chapter 17. And we'll see how the New Testament puts this. Acts chapter 17. And 
and verse 28. It says, For in, in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. In him we move and live and have our being. Look at Romans chapter 11 and verse 36. Romans 11, 36. Paul puts it this way. He says, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. How many of you woke up this morning? How many of you have air in your lungs? How many of you had enough gas in the car to get to church this morning? How many of you have clothes hanging in your closet that you put on your body? How many of you have a roof over your head? How many of you have food that you can eat? Do you not realize that you owe every bit of that to God? The only reason you have it is because He gave it to you. Now you might think it's of your own doing because you're so, more, so much more intelligent than the rest of the world or the universe, but the reason that you're so much more intelligent is because God gave you that too. Everything you have, you got from God. Now that does not just apply to the people in this room. That applies to the people that are eating breakfast out here today as well. The only reason they made it to the Hampton Inn is because God gave them the gas in the car to get here, gave them the clothes on their back to wear, gave them the air in their lungs to live. Every creature in the universe owes their entire existence to God. Very few of them acknowledge it. Very few of them do anything to pay him back. But you owe everything you have to him. And the people in this room owe him something even more. They owe him an understanding of what it is that he wants, and they owe him their life in this world as well as in the next. Okay, so when we refer to God in this study, we are referring to the one eternal, infinite, supreme being that is the creator and ruler of everything else. He created everything. He created you. There's a verse in the Bible that says that the Spirit is given by God. At the moment of, crea at the moment of conception, he, gave, he put a Spirit in there so that he, he, He's involved in everything. Everything that you are and will ever be, you owe to Him. And how little we ever think about that. How little we ever take the time to say thank you. Okay, now let's look at some of the arguments for the existence of God. Um, some of these came from Thomas Aquinas, some came from other sources. Men that were smarter than me that sat around and pondered these things and tried to think their way through it and gave us some arguments that we could use to hand down to the next generation so they could hand it down to the next generation and so on. The first argument I want to talk about well, the first thing I want to say is that the argument for the existence of God is logically compelling. If you apply logic to this, it shows that there's a God. If you, if, if you look at it from that standpoint, it's impossible to get around. So let's consider a couple of different arguments. Let's consider the argument from efficient causes. This was one of Thomas Aquinas' arguments. He probably got it from somewhere else, but he was the one that wrote the book that had it in there, so he gets the credit for it. Experience confirms an order of efficient causes. Today's Father's Day. I'm a father. I have a son sitting right there. I'm the cause of him. But I have a father also. He's long since gone on to his reward, but if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't be here. And he had a father, and if his father hadn't have been here, then he wouldn't have been here, which means I wouldn't have been here, and Joshua wouldn't have been. Wouldn't have been. Every, everything has a cause. Has a, something caused it. Something brought it into being. That's, the, the, uh, that's an experience that confirms this idea. Think about that. Everything that you look at, there was a cause to that. Going all the way back. Every effect we see has a cause. 
And that cause is in itself an effect of another prior cause. That's logical, right? We can all see that. Nothing can be the cause of itself because that would argue that it was prior to itself. Okay? In other words, the universe couldn't have created itself because if the universe created itself, it would have had to have been here to create itself. Right? Now, I know this flies in the face of a lot of these people that have this idea of a Big Bang Theory. I'm going to tell you something, folks. The Big Bang Theory is one of the most stupid things that's ever come down the pike. And it was invented by a Jesuit priest. Now, you understand that the Jesuits are a big part of the Counter-Reformation. They hate this book. They cannot stand this book. And they will do anything they can to deny and get rid of this book. Why would they do that? Because read this book. You ain't going to find a Roman Catholic Church in here. If you read this book, it's not in here. Well, it is, over in Revelation. And it's called Mystery Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. You'll find her there. But you don't find her in the new, you don't find any of that nonsense in the New Testament. So, so what do they do? They take the position that the Pope has more authority than the Word of God. And they've been fighting against this ever since the Reformation. They were fighting for against it before by keeping it out of your hands, by not allowing it to be translated. But now that it's loose, they fight against it in another method. And the Big Bang Theory is one of them. If we can convince people that the Big Bang Theory is true, well then they'll discredit the Bible and they won't pay any attention to it, and then, then we've got them because they'll listen to the Pope. So a Jesuit priest is the guy that came up with the Big Bang Theory. And it defies all the laws of physics. It makes no sense whatsoever. And the idea that it, it before that they thought, well, the, well, we'll get into that, so I don't want to jump ahead too far in the outline because we're going to deal with this when we go on. So. So let me get back to where I was. Um, an indefinite series of efficient causes would result in no first cause and no last effect. So if there's no first cause, there can't be an effect to it. Somewhere back there, somewhere, had to be a first cause. In other words, something that caused my grandfather, who was my great-grandfather, before him there had to be somebody. Eventually, you run up against, there had to be a first. You gotta start somewhere. You gotta start the ball rolling somewhere. And that first cause had to be caused by someone that was infinite. And that someone that was infinite is God. Now we have revelation here that shows us that he created two people in the Garden of Eden. And from those two people, the rest of the population came. That was, there was your first cause. If there's no last effect, then there can be no effect before it and so on. That's the other argument. So there must be a first uncaused cause, which is God, and that cause must be infinite. If it's not infinite, it has a beginning and is therefore not the first cause because something had to cause it. So God has to be infinite. And it's interesting, if you turn to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. It's interesting that God refers to himself as the first and the last. He is the first cause. He is the last effect. So that's known as the argument from efficient causes. Now I know I could go into a lot greater detail in all of these things, but I'm not going to. I'm going to give you enough that you can go out and study the rest of it on your own. I don't want to be preaching this for 17 years, so I'll give you the, the top water outline stuff and, and you all can go out and do your own research. Um, let's look at the argument 
from the decrees of perfection of characteristics. It's another one of Thomas Aquinas' arguments. Um, we think of things in terms of degrees of perfection, do we not? Some are more beautiful than others. Some are larger or smaller than others. Some are more or less something, right? We think of that, in, we think of things in that term. More or less is decided upon a degree of approach to the greatest to the perfection of the characteristic. How can you determine more or less in the absence of perfection? You have to have something that's perfect. To, you have to, have to have a benchmark. Okay? Now, let me jump off the track here for a minute. When we sit in a church and we are told that we are to strive to To be Christ-like, if you will, that's what we hear in all the churches all the time. Well, who's, Christ is God. So we should strive to be better, should we not? Should our walk not try to be better day by day? Should we not strive for perfection even though we're never going to get there? We should at least strive for it. Okay. Any arguments from there, from that? Okay, well, what are you going to set as your benchmark? Are you going to set the person sitting next to you in the church and say, as long as I'm as good as that person, I'm good enough? Is that person perfection? No. As long as I'm just, as long as I'm above the bottom tier, as long as I get a D in this, as long as I can get credit for the class, that's good enough. No, that's not what we're to do. We're to strive to be the best. And to try to be the best, we have to have a benchmark to shoot for, and that benchmark that we shoot for has to be perfection, and that is God. And that's what Thomas Aquinas was referring to. That's the only way, that's the best way that I know how to, how to explain. So there's therefore something that is most good, most great, most beautiful. And that something that is the perfection of those qualities is what we call God. And that's an argument from the degrees of perfection. Okay? Let's consider the argument from evident design in the universe. We could spend the rest of our lives looking at different characteristics in this universe and looking at the perfection of the design of them, and we would never run out of examples. Time doesn't suffice to expound all of the intricate, complex design of beings and their interactions in this universe. We probably could spend the rest of our lives looking at design perfections of people within this room. Not moral, but Think of, the, think of the human eye, how that works. I mean, it's, it's, we can't invent one today. There are so many parts of the human body that how in the world are you going to come up with this? Somebody had to design this. It didn't just happen. Consider the, the efficiency of the systems of the human body and its organs and how it works. This just happened? All of these intricacies just happened? Man's body is itself a miracle. Look at Psalm chapter 139 and verse 14. Psalm 139, 14 says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that, the, and that my soul knoweth right well. Just look around. Just open your eyes and look around at the design. Consider this. Consider the reproductive system of plants, animals, people. If everything just happened to emerge from the same soup of elements from rain falling on a rock for millions and millions of years, if we just all of a sudden life started to 
form and found somehow found something to eat and somebody to marry and created from there. How do you explain the evolution of male and female versions of plants? Have you ever considered that? That you have to have a male and a female in order to get fruit? That's what bees are for? They fly around and pollinate one tree to another so that you can get fruit off of them? That's even included in the system of trying to reproduce. If you didn't have the bees, you got nothing. We used to, in Bakersfield, there, there was a time of the year when the, when the trees would start to flower out and you would drive down the road and get bees all over your windshield because they would bring the bee boxes out and set them out by those, by those orange trees or, or almond trees or whatever it was so that the bees would go pollinate their, their tree. Then they'd haul them off somewhere else. There are so many intricacies here. It couldn't have just happened on its own. How did all this just happen to develop that way? What compelled such a development? Think about that. Consider plants that provide food and oxygen without which men and animals couldn't survive. If we didn't have plants, we wouldn't have oxygen. The plants take in the CO2 that we breathe out and convert it into oxygen and give us more air to breathe. That just happened? How do you explain the interplay between soil and sunlight and air and water in the life and growth of plants? We can't even figure out how that, we couldn't even have devised something like that as simple as a tree. Can you develop that on your own? Can you? Can a scientist sit in a laboratory with what he knows now and develop a new seed that will grow the perfect fruit? I know they try to with all the GMA stuff, but they're taking seeds that were already there and monkeying with them. Come up with it on your own. Go out there and get some dirt and turn it into a human being. Let me see you do it. How did all these vast systems just happen to come into being and interact the way that they do so to provide a specific end, and that end being the survival of the animals and the plants on this earth? How in the world could that have happened? That which asks for an end, this is something that Stephen, Stephen Charnock said, that which acts for an end unknown to itself depends upon some overruling wisdom that knows that end. Someone had to know that if this is developed and designed and created the way that it is, this will be the end result of it. And that someone was God. God understood before he created how plants would interact with humans. How they would be able to develop as energy for us so that when we eat them, when we digest them, it would provide energy for us and not kill us. These are all things that were involved in, in the mind of God before he created this universe. This argues that he is infinitely huge, infinitely intelligent, and infinitely powerful, and we don't even say thanks. To argue that such complex systems developed by accident without any guiding intelligence is farcical on face of it. Such design argues for an intelligent designer, and that intelligent designer is God. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul makes an, makes an argument that we will look at next. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So Paul argues from the visible creation that there is an invisible God that created it. 
these arguments are really subsets of this major argument. The idea of the, um, we get the exact title of it, the <coughs> evident design in the universe argument. Since every visible thing is limited and can't be of its own cause, the visible things clearly demonstrate an invisible cause. Does that make sense? Everything that's here is going to wear out. It's going to run down. It couldn't have caused itself. Somebody had to cause it. Therefore, it argues for the, the, the one that caused it. Somebody had to set this whole thing in motion. Somebody had to create it, and that someone that created it is God. And it's clearly seen. Paul says that this is clearly seen. The visible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They're unmistakable. How, how in the world could this have just happened? You know, back to that Big Bang thing, they, they now have it down to the point where they used to teach that all the matter in the universe condensed into a very small area, and, and then it started spinning really fast, and then it finally exploded, and that's what created everything you see today. Um, they've now gotten it down, but then people started asking questions like, well, where did the matter come from? If all the matter condensed, where did the matter come? Now they've got it down to the point that there wasn't any matter. And it just, nothing started to spin and it spun faster and faster and exploded. And they teach this in colleges. And it's and students sit there and <laughs> then listen and drink it in. They start it in kindergarten and they indoctrinate people so that by the time you get to college you already believe it and they and they just and they use peer pressure and they use the idea that if you don't go along with this you're not going to get to be popular among the other students you're, you'll be an outcast and and so they, they pressure you into believing this nonsense and it's foolishness if you just sit back and think about it so Paul says that it's clearly seen. It's not an opinion. It wasn't Paul's opinion. He says it's clearly seen. Therefore, to deny the invisible God is to deny the obvious. From the visible universe, we can conclude that God's eternal power and Godhead must be, must be massive. Think about this. God's bigger than this universe. Now look at the universe. Right? He's the biggest. He's the greatest in all things. Size and everything else. He's everywhere. So look at the size of the universe and then wonder why it is. Why can't he take care of my puny little problems? Because you won't let him. He could if you let him, but you won't let him do it. Now, he talks here about the God referring to the Godhead, it says, with his eternal power and Godhead. The Godhead is the character or the quality of being God or a God, divine nature or essence. The idea of deity, that's the Godhead. And his Godness, as it were, is the fact that he exists as God and can be deduced from the world that he made. If you just sit out there and look at it and think about it for a while, you're going to have to come up to the conclusion that somebody created this stuff. And we'll get into some more arguments about that in a few minutes. We've already seen how the reasoning from the visible chain of cause and effect would come back to an infinite first cause. A cause of an eternal, unending, limitless power. That's the Godhead that we're talking about. Now let's look at there are four possible explanations as to how this universe got here. So let's look at them briefly. The first is that the universe spontaneously emerged from nothing. This is the Big Bang idea. It just spontaneously happened. And this is refuted by the fact that nothing does not produce anything. Something has to produce something. If you sit there and don't do anything, is anything going to come of it? You have to do something to produce something else. Everyone understands that. 
It's the same way with the universe. It can't just spontaneously happen. Somebody had to start, the, had to get it started. If you look from, let's go back to the Big Bang. If the thing started spinning, who started it spinning? If it was matter that was spinning, where'd the matter come from? Where did the energy come from that caused it to spin? Why did it explode? At what particular, what caused that to happen? Was it a law of the universe that caused it to happen? One of the laws of physics? Well, then where did the laws come from? Did, it, did those just spontaneously happen as well? No, somebody had to come up with this stuff. And that somebody is God. So even if God did use the Big Bang, which he didn't, but if he did, he would still have had to have been there to get the ball rolling. Right? Now we're told how he did it in the first, chapter, first few chapters of Genesis. He told us how he went about creating the world. He did not use the Big Bang to do it. He could have. He could have done it any way he wanted to. He could have spoke it all into existence in one absolute mere second. In one nanosecond. He chose not to, to teach us that we cannot work seven days a week and survive. That we need to have a day of rest. That if you work seven days a week long enough, you will fall over dead. So he used that as a lesson to us, an object lesson, so that we would understand that one day of the week, we needed to rest. So he created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. That was for uh, our benefit, not for his. He could have done it like that. Now, so the idea of the universe spontaneously emerging from nothing makes no sense. No, next, the universe is eternal. Some people will say that the universe itself is eternal. Um, the second law of thermodynamics destroys that idea. There are two, the two most proven laws of science are the first and second law of thermodynamics. And it pays well for you to understand these. According, the, the first law of, of, uh, of thermodynamics teaches that no energy is being created. That, that energy is, is equal, that it, that it doesn't create itself. You cannot create more energy from energy. All the energy in the universe is here. Now it changes forms. It does change form. And that's based on the second law of thermodynamics. But the first law says that there's no energy being created. Okay? The second law says that all energy is tending towards entropy. In other words, it's wearing out. Or it's running down. It's turning into chaos. So if you have a level set of energy that is running out, eventually you're not going to have any anymore. It's going to run out. It'll be there, but it won't. It won't be useful for anything. Okay, this, it'll still have the same amount of it, but it won't be any good. It'll wear out. It won't be valuable anymore um, for any kind of a use. Well, if you consider that, then the universe cannot be eternal because it's still here. Does that make sense? If all energy is tending towards entropy and is running out, it would have run out by now. And we wouldn't be here. And this would just be a cold, dark planet floating around in space somewhere. Since we're still here, it argues that we had to get started some, sometime in the past, and we haven't run all the way out yet but eventually we will, okay? Um, turn to Psalms chapter 102. Psalms 102, verses 25 and 6. Say, of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. 
Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment as a vesture, shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. David understood it better than modern day physicists understand. Everything is wearing out. This thing started like winding up a clock. You know, we have a little Winnie the Pooh clock that sits on the mantle, a little alarm clock that Winnie got, I don't know how many hundreds of years ago. Well, not hundreds, but. And you wind it up, right? You wind this clock up and it sits there and it will tick, 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 tick until it winds down. And when it winds down, it quits ticking. And it quits keeping time. Well, that's the universe, friends. God started this thing and wound it up. And it has been wearing out ever since. You know, the Earth's spinning a little bit slower now than it was last year. And it'll spin a little bit slower next year than it does this year. You know, the moon is moving farther and farther away from the Earth. Now, it's not huge amounts, but it's, it's because the Earth is slowing down, we're losing our gravitational pull on the moon. And so the moon is very slowly moving farther and farther away from the Earth. And its orbit is starting to slow down. The universe is wearing out. It will eventually wear out. Therefore, since it hasn't worn out yet, it cannot have been here forever. It had to have a beginning. Okay, So that's the argument um, against the idea that the universe is uh, eternal. Another argument that is actually posited by people, some people, is that the universe doesn't really exist. Yes, there are people that argue that, that the universe doesn't really exist. Um, but that's refuted by experience. You have to affirm the existence of the universe in order to deny it. This is one of the things that atheists have a hard time with. They have to accept the concept of a god in order to deny that there is a god. Right? And my other question is, why do you make so much noise about it? <coughs> if there isn't one, there isn't, you know, this is one of the things that I, I, I... Let's say I'm wrong, okay? Let's say I'm wrong and there is no God. That when I die, I turn into dirt. Let's say that's really, let's say that's true, okay? Am I harming anyone by teaching that they should be more moral? that they should be more responsible, that they should live a better life? Am, am I harming you by doing that? Am I causing anyone any grief by doing that? I don't think so. I don't think I'm causing any harm. Um, okay, so I die and turn into dirt. I'll never know it. Neither will you. Because if we just die and turn into dirt, we, we turn into dirt. So if I'm wrong, this is a better place to be than if, I mean, if, yeah, if I'm wrong, I'm not harming anyone. Now, let's take the position of the guy out here that's an atheist. What happens if he's wrong? If he's wrong, he's going to stand before an angry God when all this time he thought he was just going to turn into dirt. See, this is another argument. It's not in the outline, but this is the argument that it's, it's more reasonable to believe in a God. Because by believing in one, I'm not causing you any any grief. I'm not causing you any pain. If anything, I'm trying to build you up and make you better people. And if, we, if you live a better life and you die and turn into dirt, okay, well, you lived a better life and died and turned into dirt. Where the atheist on the other side of the equation is teaching people that you have no responsibility to anyone. There's no accountability. You can make up your own laws as you want to. If you want to go shoot up a bunch of people in church, have at it because your opinion is just as valid as somebody else's. That's where that leads if you follow it to its logical conclusion. If you take the position of godlessness that is taught around here by all of these people, then you have to ask the question, why are they surprised when there's evil in the world? Because you just told people you're no different than an animal. Did anybody ever get mad at a lion for eating a zebra? You think the zebras come after him and try to throw him in jail for doing that? No, he's an animal. 
That's what animals do. And if we're animals, then we live like animals. And that's what we're being taught by most of the people in the world out there. Sorry to me to jump on another soapbox and ride a rabbit for a while. Um, okay, the universe does not exist. Now you have to affirm the existence of the universe in order to deny it. And the person who denies the existence of the universe is himself a part of the universe. He has to therefore deny his own existence. Right? So that's just an absolute absurdity. Um, now there's only one other, there's only one, only, only one other possibility. The first one's that it spontaneously emerged, the second that it's eternal, the third that it doesn't exist, and the fourth is that a power greater than the universe brought it into being. That's the only other, that's the only other option. So if it, if it does, if, if it didn't spontaneously come from nothing, we've already shown it's not eternal, and it doesn't make sense that it doesn't exist. The only thing we're left with is that a greater, than, a greater power than the universe itself brought it into being. In other words, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1. Hence it is that the visible creation proves the existence of a creator, and that creator is God. So the existence of God is so clearly proven from the visible universe that all men are without excuse for not believing in the existence of God. And they're going to stand before him one of these days, and they're going to have to say, well, I just didn't know any better. Well, how could you not know better? Did you ever look out the window of an airplane when it was flying at 30,000 feet and look? Did you ever walk outside and stare at the sky and wonder about where the clouds came from? Did you ever go out and look at the moon? Did you ever go out on a, on a clear night in the middle of the woods where there's no lights and look at the stars? They're without excuse. There's absolutely no excuse. Okay, our next point. The existence of God can be deduced from the fact that all men acknowledge a standard of right and wrong that is above them and by which they judge their actions. How many times do men quarrel because one thinks the other one's treated him unfairly? You ever see that? You ever seen that? How many times do men quarrel over broken promises? How many times do marriages get in trouble because, the, because of, of these types of things? Because somebody thinks they did them wrong. In all these quarrels, men are appealing to some standard of fairness, some standard of right and wrong over them that they expect other men to accept and abide by. Right? I mean, if somebody steals from me, and I get upset with it, Where's the standard that says they can't? Do we judge the animal world for that? Do we punish one of our dogs because he goes and gets the bone of the other dog? I mean, even dogs will fight over things like that. So even they recognize that there's a standard that, that should be followed. Every courthouse in the land is a standing testimony that there is such a thing as justice, that there's such a thing as right and wrong, even if it's not upheld in that courthouse. The fact that the courthouse is there teaches that man recognizes that there has to be a standard of right and wrong in order to live by. And it's interesting that evil people generally want to be thought of as good. You ever notice that? That's why they're so involved in civic things. That's why they want to be looked at as the good and gracious philanthropists. Even though deep down inside they're the most evil thing walking on the planet. But they want to be seen as being, why? Why is that? Where did that come from? Where did the need for that come from? Now if you follow this back to its logical conclusion, you have to come back to an absolute standard of right and wrong that has some authority behind it, otherwise this all goes out the window. Any standard that's devised only by the authority of man is not absolute because times 
and circumstances change. We can see that going on here in this nation right now. What used to be illegal is now lauded as being wonderful. Well, where's the standard? It, it's, it changes based upon the opinions of people. It changes based upon the times. That's not, a, that's not an absolute standard to set anything by, is it? If, we can, if you can get more people to go along with your opinion, then somebody else can get to go along with their opinion. Your opinion now becomes right and theirs becomes wrong. What, who's to say what one man's opinion of right or wrong is superior to another man's opinion of right or wrong? Think about this. We had this thing during World War II called the Holocaust. You remember that? We still have genocide happening everywhere. Why is that wrong? I speak foolishly, but think of, ponder that for a who, whoever's Why is that wrong? Adolf Hitler got a lot of his teaching from a, from a book that came out in the 1850s, I think it was, um, called, well, it had two titles. The first title you're probably more familiar with than the second. The second was um, The Struggle for the Preservation of Favored Races. Okay? That was the, it had a first title. And then have the little word or the struggle for the preservation of favored races. And, and, and Adolf Hitler liked that book a lot and, and deduced from that book that, that there were different races that were farther removed from the apes and that the Aryan race was the most pure and that the black race was very close to ape and that the Jewish race was the closest to the ape. And so he was taking that position to say, well, if we kill off all the Jews, then that will help in this struggle for the preservation of favored races. He probably, had he killed off all the Jews, it wouldn't have surprised me if he had then started going after the blacks until he could create a pure race. That's what he was dealing with. That book was written by a guy by the name of Charles Darwin, and the first title is Origin of Species. Evolution. The idea of evolution has been one of the greatest sources of genocide that we've ever seen. And we see it constantly. Is that okay? Do you not see it now in this country? No, they call it different, something different. They call it abortion. Still genocide. We're still killing people off for the benefit of others because it's inconvenient to have children. Now, we have people here that will fight to the death for, for the right to do that. Now, that's where who made who came up with the idea that that's all right. Why is that opinion more value, valid? than those of us that, that, that believe that those children in the womb are children. Why is their opinion more about it? Because they got the votes? You see, if we don't have a standard by which we can stand on, there's no telling where this is going to head. If we, if, if we are, because I remember, you know what, I was, I was in high school when Roe v. Wade was passed. In fact, I was out of high school. I think I was already out of high school by the time Roe v. Wade was passed. So, prior to that, abortion was illegal in this country. That doesn't mean that they didn't do it, but it was illegal. And then all of a sudden it became legal, and, and look where we are now. Where, where are we going to be in another hundred years if we're still here? What's society going to be like then if we keep changing the rules? If we don't have anything absolute to stand on? So any standards devised only by the authority of man is not absolute. The only absolute authority is God. And God gave us an absolute standard to live by. Right? And so, based on that, we have the 
we have God as the source of all moral authority. Now that's as far as we're going to go for this morning. I thought we'd get farther, but we're running short on time. So um, next week we will pick up with the universal experience of mankind that that confirms the existence of God and we'll continue on from there. Um, with that, let's, uh, let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.